Sometimes life doesn't really go the way that we expect it to. For example, I thought I would be starting this video with some sort of dramatic narrative essay about the major life things I had learned while traveling in Japan. I had this whole plan to end it with uh, a dramatic line about how the planes took us the only place the trains couldn't go, home. And uh, I was going to make it about um, all the big things I learned while abroad. But uh, sometimes you don't write beautiful narrative essays like A Cabin in the Woods is Not the Answer. And all you've got is this video. That's kind of how my life has been lately. That was a convoluted metaphor. <laughs> um, so as of June 2nd uh, of this year, I got engaged. Uh, very specifically, I proposed to my boyfriend of nine years. Um, we've been dating since high school, sometimes off and on. Uh, you know how it is in college and long distance and all that. Sometimes it's been a little rocky, but over the last three years of living with him here, I just sort of realized I, there's no one else I want to be with. This is, this, is, this is my guy. And so uh, I did what any normal person would do. I made an entire escape room out of our house. I constructed a, a, an elaborate excuse for why all our friends were over. Uh, we, I got invited them all over to play Blades in the Dark. Um, and we uh, played the first half of a one-shot. Uh, and then my boss was, quote-unquote, coming over to show me how to use his fancy camera because I was, quote-unquote, making a doll video before I went to Japan. And I'll uh, show you the camera here. It was extremely fancy. Um, so no, I was not learning how to use that to make a doll video. Uh, so he came over. Um, and uh, he filmed the whole thing. Um, that video is just for me and my family. Um, sorry if you're disappointed and you don't get to see my cool escape room YouTube video proposal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so he did this whole escape room. At the end of it, uh, I performed a magical dance. That was uh, for the story of the escape room was that I was kidnapped by demons, and he had to find a way to break down the barrier between the demon world and our world. And so, me kidnapped off, um, I did a magical dance to break the barrier, and then I proposed to him. And demons like apparently love humans with big ambitions, and uh, uh, and they but they will return them to the human world if they love each other. And so that was the that was the whole premise. Uh, an excuse. Um, we have always been a couple who, uh, I mean, we started dating because of D&D. &D. Um, we regularly uh, role play stuff together. Um, just like, you know, elaborate, long, angsty scenes, gods having battles, that sort of thing. Um, and he helps a lot with the writing of Isaiah. Um, so this just seemed like the right way to do it. And he said yes. Uh, there are some times when I kind of wondered if he actually would say yes. Oh, and leading up to it, I was so nervous because he was in, he was kind of in a bad mood because of work lately, and so I, and then he was like kind of feeling unwell, and so I was really worried that when our friends came over, he was going to be like, yeah, I'm not really feeling the social thing. Um, he kept going on like late night bike rides and stuff, and I was like, dude. If my fiancé vanishes before he becomes my fiancé, I'm going to die. Imagine, imagine being like a man who can just go on a bike ride at like 12 a.m. without telling anyone and you're not worried that you're going to get decked or kidnapped or whatever, mugged or, or worse, you know? Uh, incredible. Um, but uh, he cheered up by the end of the week. Uh, he said yes. There were definitely times when I wasn't sure we'd... Uh, get to this point in a relationship, but I think we're both pretty committed at this point to whatever comes ahead. I mean, it's been nine years, right? Like, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> Even if the nature of the relationship changes sometime in the future, we're not, it's, it probably isn't going to end anytime soon. Um, so that was kind of a whole life shift as I realized, you know, just to what extent 
I mean, obviously, you know, you, when you're in, you've been together for that long, you kind of expect the person's going to stick around, but we're committed to it now. So that's, that's a, shi just a shift in how you plan for the future and stuff. Um, and then my boss, my manager, who came in, you know, filmed my video, he was removed from his position uh, that following Monday. And there was um, a lot of drama around that and, and my workplace, I mean, as it always is. Uh, and then I left for Japan. And, um, you know, I spent two weeks in Japan and that was, ma uh, that was incredible. Um, you know, I got to eat 7-Eleven food <laughs> and have it be actually good. That was incredible. What an experience going in a 7-Eleven getting fresh food. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I feel like I shouldn't just talk about 7-Eleven, but 7-Eleven is truly the biggest culture shock. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we stayed in this lovely hotel that had an onsen, uh, so I used that every night. Um, we went to Hakone in Unison, which ha are these like super famous hot springs resort. Uh, we looked at Mount Fuji. We tried to go to a volcano, but it was too windy and misty, and we, we, we were not allowed. Literally, it was like when you would try to take a step forward, the wind was blowing so hard that you couldn't put it, your foot did not go down where you anticipated it was going to go down. It was very dangerous. This is just cake in a box. Uh, but it was very it was very cool. We got to eat the black eggs of Iwakudani. Um, we uh, we of course went to all the famous districts in Tokyo, from uh, you know Harajuku to uh, you know Asakusa, um, uh, Shinjuku. Uh, uh, we didn't do Ikebukuro because neither of us care that much about shopping malls or Pokemon. Um, oh, we went to the Sanrio Land. You know, I don't know. Just like we just sort of enjoyed our you know time overseas we spent like every day exploring a different district um i mean obviously we spent a lot of time with each other and just relaxing or walking around places i don't know it was just it was just such a different experience from what my everyday life had been for the last you know two three years here um working from home and stuff i had really gotten into a routine there um so it was nice to have um, that break, uh, especially since work was stuff was transitioning. And then on Monday morning, when I got back after my trip, I was laid off from my job, right? Like, that's crazy, man. I've just been in such a weird, emotional, like fugue state since it all happened. I don't even know how I feel about all that still. And um, I don't want to like throw, I'm, just to be clear, this is not like, the company's not like, um, you know, doing anything wrong or anything. I, it, it, these it just sort of business happens and it is what it is. But like, you know, I was really expecting this position to be a lot, to be more stable than some of the other ones in the industry. Maybe it's just because everyone assumes it's not going to happen to them. But anyway, we're here now, and, you know, things aren't always going to be how you expect. And that's a little scary sometimes. So... As you may or not may not be able to tell, I'm not really in a place to be making a YouTube video here at all. But I only release one of these things a month, and you know, you can at least like look at my footage from Japan. I filmed it specifically for this video, so here you go. Look at all this. It's look. It's Japan. It's the vibes. It's the Japan vibes. There you go. Um, <laughs> but I guess. You know, the only place to look is to look forward. Um, so, you know, I've been, last week I spent a lot of time getting my resume and my portfolio back into shape. 
because um, I really haven't touched it since I started my last job. They always say that you should be keeping your, your resume portfolio in tip-top shape at all times, constantly ready to be, that you should have the next job lined up before you lose your current job sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was kind of prepared. I was like posting things on LinkedIn. Does that count as being prepared to take on a job? Not really. Um, <laughs> and then these, uh, I've also, you'll, you'll probably be happy to hear that I've been putting in a bunch of effort on the ISEA world guide. Um, as you may or may not know, my website has been, has lost its images. Um, Wix used to have this thing where it would have, it had like a hundred gigabytes or something like that. Like it was a lot of storage space and on its free plan. And then it switched to a, um, to 500 megabits on its free plan. And let me tell you, that's a lot smaller. So basically I didn't have room for all of my images anymore. Um, and I was trying to figure out some sort of workaround with like an image hosting like external site, uh, but it just was, uh, it still is like difficult to manage just because I've, I've done so much art for Isaiah and I want you guys to be able to see it and have that available to you. Um, just to like see the progress over the years, you know, it's just, it's kind of neat to see the whole catalog of someone's collection. Um, and, uh, you know, with the death of Twitter, uh, yeah, I know, that was a bit ago, uh, but I've been working on this for a while now and just, you know, haven't gotten around to it. It sort of made me realize, though, that while everyone was telling me as a kid growing up, like, oh, anything you post on the internet is forever, so be really careful about it, I don't think things on the internet are forever. Think about how much dead and lost media there is on the internet now. Like, yeah, it'll be on, it may be forever, it may not be. Um, so maybe don't put things on the internet that you really care about. Maybe put things that you really care about somewhere that you can physically access them or honestly just in multiple locations. Um, so yeah, my actual current plan now, cause like, you know, if all global internet infrastructure were lost tomorrow, I would lose a ton of my ISEA stuff. And even if, you know, we lost like computers and such and I, I couldn't view it like, couldn't watch any of my videos or play any of my games, I would want some sort of record of all this work I've done. So I've started working, so one of the things with this world guide is I'm basically making a giant PDF and then I'm planning on uh, printing it out and then I'll do like new editions every year or something like an actual like book person. Wow, can you believe it? Um, but yeah, no, I think that's important. And, um, you know, I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll keep electronic copies too. And I'll, I want the PDF to be available on the website. Ideally, even what I'll do is I'll make it so that it's the only thing on the website, right? And then you just like flip through it. Like the website is just a but like one of those e-readers basically is sort of my idea now um, for how I'm going to handle this. Um, so that's what I've been working on to add to my portfolio uh, because I don't think employers are going to have a very easy understand time understanding uh, just how big all this stuff is. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be in an industry where this is all act is rele relevant portfolio piece. I know I have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, I've got this giant world that I'm building, but it's not like relevant to my job or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's the number one thing I've been working on. Um, I've also been doing edits. I think some of you have heard. Um, I was actually going to make a whole push for it here in July where I was going to like work really hard to get mm, everything edited and then I got laid off and then that is not really happening. I am, I have been working with one of my friends though to get stuff edited still. Um, uh, oh, I've mentioned him on the channel before and his name's Kelp, it's very cool. Uh, and um, yeah, so he's been going through edits with me. If you wanna help with edits, um, you're welcome to, I guess, jump into my Discord or whatever and uh, read my 250,000 word uh, epic of Iseo World Letters. Um, 
because I'm doing my... I don't know if I've talked about this yet on this channel. I guess here's my like soft launch announcement. My plan for the future with Isaya is I am doing all of this writing with it, and I know that it is not getting read to the extent that I would want it to be. And I was thinking about, well, how do I make this more marketable and palatable to people? How do I make it so that people understand what this product is? And what I realized is that my world letters I mean, a lot of their flaws and features um, come from the fact that it's designed like it's a visual novel script. And I was like, well, I think I got to make it into a video game then. Um, but after doing some initial market research on visual novels, um, especially kinetic visual novels, the visual novels that tend to do really well are all, um, they're either horror or their romance and this is neither um and even some of the best-selling visual novels like house of fata morgana that a bunch of people recommended that to me and you know that's just a visual novel um or uh you know higurashi when they cry or um what are some other famous ones i don't know like the fate visual novels mm, people still like those many of them are either free or didn't probably like using steam's uh revenue calculator thing probably just didn't make that much money like mm, made like a couple mm, uh hundred thousand which is still like yeah that's a lot of money that if i made a, a couple hundred thousand that would be life-changing money but the thing is is that these are like the biggest of the big games right and for five years of work so far and counting that I don't want that to be my cap on what I could possibly get out of this and, and you know the money isn't the most important thing to me I wouldn't be doing this at all if it mm, was money but if the point is to make a shift to make this more marketable right the, then I need to make it something that will actually potentially sell and so and I thought about games that I would actually play and I realized that I also just don't play that many visual novels as much as i respect them as a medium and i would find them easier to make than i than other games i don't think that i should do something just because it's easy either and so what i sort of came to the conclusion of is that i want to make the isaya the isaya game the as of now untitled isaya game as i've been calling it um into like an RPG Maker style game where it's like those RPG Maker games from the 20, they were really popular here in the 2010s, though a lot of them were made way earlier, like in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Um, but they were all popular in the 10s, like Witch's House, Owl Oni, um, there was some Mad Father, uh, oh, there was another, oh, To the Moon, yes, of course, To the Moon, yeah. And, um, uh, I wouldn't throw Undertale in there. I was going to say Undertale sort of has a similar sort of vibe, but then Undertale also has combat, so ignore that. I'm not, I'm not really planning on having a combat system. But yeah, where it's like mostly a story, but also it's an exploration game. You walk around, you do puzzles, you talk to people, you read lore, um, you know. So basically, I'm looking to make an RPG without the RPG elements. Um, and I think that would just do much better like that's actually exactly the sort of game that i would actually play um uh oh wada no Hara and the great blue sea um mineko castle that sort of stuff although those also have combat systems but they're like really unimportant um and uh so yeah that's sort of my idea for the future of isaya after i finish this guide here which is why i've been working on all the character sprites and stuff lately that you've been seeing me post um, and, um, and it's also why I haven't really continued doing the audiobook series is because I realized I have a lot of edits I want to do to make it better. Um, and so I've been working with, uh, people to do that and because it's really important to me that this story is as good as it can be. One thing I tell myself though whenever I get too anxious is that... Um, I do genuinely believe that my writing is just, like, quant qualitatively better wow. 
than some of the stuff I've been reading lately. Um, and that might sound arrogant, but I just think that like my plot is generally, or my, I have cohesive plots, but I have really character focused writing and I, my world building is cohesive as you guys can see from watching this channel and how the world building makes sense. Um, and the way that characters act because of the world building makes sense. Like you can, every time I think about, or I try to do some sort of exercise where I'm like, okay, what if my characters were not in this world or something? It's like, then they would be completely different people because they're very much shaped by the cultures and the geopolitics in them. So mm, I, have mm, I have a lot of confidence in the overall like structural integrity of my work. And now it's just a matter of ensuring that the way that is presented reads like it's structurally sound. Um, because, you know, you can have a building that technically won't fall over, but it looks like it will. And um, the goal is to make it so that my buildings do not look like they're going to fall over. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope that metaphor made sense. Um, yeah, man. I don't know. That's, that's the future I'm looking towards. And that's Something that it gives me hope no matter what the status of my, my current job status is. And uh, no matter what my marital status is or my location in the world, that's something that continues to really drive me and give me a lot of hope. I don't really know what the point of this video is, though. Oh, well, oh, uh, it was my, my thesis statement was things aren't always how you anticipate that they, they'll be. And, you know, when I first started writing Nisea, I also didn't anticipate that it was going to be, um, you know, anything. I never anticipated that it would get very big. Um, I always anticipated it would just be like me and my friends and that maybe... I'd become a writer with a small audience of people, of dedicated people, and I don't know if that's all I want to do anymore. Maybe I do want to be someone who is widely appreciated and accepted or whatever. And that's something that, you know, will have to come with time and patience and marketing and stuff and, you know, talent and luck and all those things. So. It's not something I can necessarily make happen, but it's there, there are steps I can take towards making it happen. Just like I can't determine if someone will hire me or not, but there are steps I can do take to make myself more hireable. And just like I can't determine if I will be married or not, but there are steps I can take towards being, uh, it, towards being married, like do it, throwing a fancy over-the-top proposal engagement ceremony thing so um i yeah i guess my point is that yes things will not always be what they seem but you gotta just go with the process sometimes and that's what i'm going with right now there you go i found i found a big life lesson in my long ramblings <laughs> <sighs> well, thank you for watching this today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, I hope you'll be excited for the future of Isaiah, because I know that I certainly am. Fish. Fish. Yeah. 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 Yeah.